Good morning, everybody. I'm Lonnie, and uh, I'm with Jesus Name Ministries, and I would like to wish you and your family a Merry Christmas, and uh, we just want to kind of uh, go through some things here this morning. Uh, just pray for your family, and then hope God blesses you in those holidays, and uh, be, a, be a blessing to someone. Amen. So, Anyhow, our, our discussion here this morning is, is we're going we're gonna to comment on should New Testament believers tithe? And this, uh, again, we, we did one the other day. Uh, this is in episode nine with uh, Dr. David Bernard. Um, and so we just want to kind of run through this. These are a couple subjects that I have been teaching on, and I want to show you a contrast of what is being taught today. Um, versus what I have been saying. And I just want to bring out some of those things so that you can better understand what the Bible says and what was meant. Amen. So here we go. We're going to we're gonna listen in on a, on a little bit of uh, this uh, video here. Again, Should New Testament Believers Tithe? Episode 9. And you can find this on YouTube, Apostolic Life in the 21st Century. Malachi 3.10 quotes God as saying, and I'm paraphrasing, but bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And, and God even offers a challenge to his people. He said that if you'll do this, I will pour out a blessing that there won't be room enough to receive it. Now, proponents of tithing or giving 10% of your income to the Lord, they frequently quote this verse in support of that message. However, there are people who come back and say that verse is from the Old Testament and it does not apply to New Testament believers, that New Testament believers are not bound by that particular provision of the law of Moses. What does the Bible actually teach about the topic of tithing? Let me start by saying certainly and absolutely the Bible teaches good financial stewardship. It actually teaches that 100% of what we have belongs to God because God has given us life, health, strength, ability, intellect, time, so everything we earn is because of God. So we shouldn't think of just a portion belongs to God. 100% belongs to God. That means we should be good stewards of everything. Uh, it's not just, well, if I give a certain amount to the church, then I can spend the rest however I want. No, actually, 100% of what we spend should be in accordance with biblical principles. And the Bible certainly teaches us that we should give to God's house, to God's cause, to God's kingdom. Uh, and to ministers of the gospel. Right? Okay, so again, I just want to say here, uh, this is about tithes, um, but he's kind of taken it off the tithes and said basically we should give 100% to God. Um, does that just include tithes? No. If we're to give 100% to God, that would mean we would give 100% because everything belongs to God, as, as, as Mr. Bernard said. Um, is that just money? What about our breath that we breathe? Uh, what about our time? What about our jobs? Uh, what about a business? Um, what about spending time in, in prayer? Um, so when you make drastic statements like that, uh, we should give 100%. Uh, it's kind of going off of, off of the, the subject. We're talking about tithe means ten, a tenth. That's what the, the, the name tithe means in the dictionary. A tenth. So he's already went to 100% here. Um, and, and you'll see that Mr. Bernard, um, and I've heard this already, um, a pastor in Michigan, um, very influent in their region, uh, gives a lot of money to the organizations. And he says you should be paying 15%. And anything that you don't spend, you should pay on that too. Uh, which kind of, I guess he got it off of this guy here. Uh, which is pretty pretty raw and uh, I don't know how you live life more abundantly when you're giving it all to the to a church and an organization and saying God I'm trusting my resources to people I probably don't even know uh, so anyhow here's where we are about the tenth and as you know that the he had started this off saying people disagree with the fact that. Um, Malachi 3 and, and, and 9, 10 is, is, is saying that give your tithes to the storehouse. Um, so anyhow, let's, let's let uh, Mr. Bernard continue on here, and we're going we're gonna to discuss a few things here. That's clear. Uh, 
the question then becomes, what's the exact mechanism? Now, tithing as such is considered 10% of income. Now, when we talk about income, it's of increase. All right. I just want to stop here for a second. And, and the reason I'm doing so is I wanted to bring in another thing that this is, this is what um, another discussion that Dr. Bernard had. All right. And he had this with, um, this is about the authority of scripture with Colin Crestman who is at the Urshan College, is a professor in teaching the authority of Scripture. So I just want to kind of play this a second to kind of get a, an idea how they're perceiving and, and, and seeing Scripture in one other area, and then we'll go back to the tithe thing and, and see if we can apply that same principle that he talked about over here to the tithing. Here we go. How... Um, it, it, whether you yourself are giving advice to your students, give us some advice on how to study the Bible. Because after all, if we just believe the Bible is the Word of God but don't study it, it doesn't really do us much good. So how do we study the Word of God effectively? So how would we study tithes? That's, that's what I want to focus on here. Let's say number one rule In general. is quantity equals quality. And I find more and more with students, uh, we are impacted by our culture we want everything fast microwaved and so one of the dangers we run into is we we're scratching our head wondering how what do these two verses mean but reading say instead of just reading two verses out of the book of galatians read the entire book of galatians and that actually brings the context for everything that paul is talking about and the point i'm making here is Read the whole context of tithing. What was tithing for? Who was it for? Why was it instituted in the Old Testament? Why did Abraham give a tenth to Melchizedek, the high priest? Um, who was Melchizedek? Do we have any history of Melchizedek? Why would, why would Abraham give that? So if we run to an end of the road and we, don't, we can't figure out why he would do that, so we just pick it up and do it because he did it. Well, I could apply that to so many other things and be very wrong and not make heaven my home. So we have to vary carefully. That's why the Bible said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a, a, a workman that needeth not be shame, rightly dividing the word of truth. We also have to, he said, study the scripture for in it you think you have eternal life. Okay, so we're talking about studying. He's talking about backing up and saying, okay, let's look at the big picture here. Don't just take a couple words. Don't just read Malachi 3 and 16 or 3 and 9, 10, 8, uh, 7 through there. Don't just, don't just say, oh, well, bring all the ties into the storehouse. Okay, um, and that was talking to a specific party and it was talking about that the heavens will open and, and, and God will pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. And he's talking about, well, man, rob God. Okay, so they want to apply this to your financial income. And there was no monetary, none at all was ever given to this. And they say, well, you know, they that was the culture then. Okay, well, no, they still had money. And they could have gave money because with money, you can buy whatever you want. So I would say that'd be a higher honor to give money. But you know, that wasn't the, the, the purpose of this. It wasn't to give of your increase to make someone else increase. It was for needs. And that's not what we give tithes for today at churches. We build bigger churches. We, build, we buy pastors' cars. We pay their mortgage payments. All these things. We pay light bills. We pay all this. That's what the money goes for, a, a dead building. Not, not a community outreach to feed the poor. None of that's happening with ties today. A very small percentages. So let's, let's follow what David Bernard said about um, Colin Cressman. Uh, uh, tell us how to study. And we're going to listen to him. And then he just said to back up and look at the big picture. Why would we do something? And who's it talking about? Okay. So the first thing I would encourage is we're possible some books are quite long but where possible try to read an entire book of the bible in one sitting and that will just automatically give you context 
And that is really uh, important on, in many levels, context of what is what you're reading that day. So more than just a couple of verses, read a whole chunk, read a, a complete story. But then you can look at context of the, the world. And there's all kinds of uh, resources out there. One resource from uh, our own publishing of PPH is the handbooks that we have on the Bible. We have them for all of the Old Testament sections and New Testament. And those types of resources will give you uh, background information on the culture, the time. And you need to understand that, and that will really help put pieces together. Uh, John Walton says that the Bible... Okay, so that's, that's kind of the point that I wanted to make. So look at the culture, the time, who it's talking to, what the purpose of it was. Um, is it extendable? Is it needful in a different area? Um, so, so those things here you have to consider. So, but let's let's go back to the tithing. Let's go back to test New Testament believers tithe. Okay, here we go back again. It's not simply um, if you um, if you have a business, for example, you may have some expenses of operating that business. So you would not necessarily tithing would not be considered on all the revenue that comes in, you have to take your revenue less your expenses, and what is the increase? That's your true income, and then tithing would be on that increase or that income. Well, having said that, it is true that the detailed system of tithing was given under the Law of Moses. However, tithing as a principle actually preceded the Law of Moses. From the very beginning, God's people were giving offerings and sacrifices you see cake. okay here we go here we go with the switch a tithe and an offering is totally different a tithe is exactly a tenth now he switched it to offering that the people god gave offerings okay now we we know the bible says god loveth a cheerful giver but nowhere is it talking about tithing that is a, a an exact amount and now he has switched from 10% to just general giving here. And I want you to make sure that you note these things of what this man is saying, because it matters. Cain and Abel, giving of, Cain gave vegetables, and because he was a farmer, and Abel gave a lamb, up because he was a shepherd. Now, so if you want to apply those principles, if I'm a mechanic, I'll help you with your car, okay? Um, if I'm a computer person, I'll help you with your computer. So if you want, if you want to bring that to modern reality today, show me where in the scripture, the culture, how that equates to financial, monetary money system. Cain had a wrong spirit, wrong attitude, and God didn't accept his sacrifice. But there was no question there was supposed to be an offering. To so God didn't accept his sacrifice. So tell me, what pastor, what church has ever said, I don't like your attitude. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna re I'm I'm gonna put that money back in your account because you gave it with a bad attitude. I wanna know how many pastors have done that. Have you had deposits back from church because you may have went into a certain disagreement with your with your pastor and he decided you know you you just aren't right you you need to change that attitude maybe you had a counseling with them have you seen that happen no okay well let's let's be real here right god the sacrifice and even in a rural agrarian economy where they probably didn't have money or not much in the way of what's called money they were expected to give something of their increase of what was produced by their labor that was more than what they had before. I don't know if you can see this, you can go watch the video, but I see uh, Dr. David Bernard struggling here. I see it in his face and I've watched his videos before. So that's a principle that far uh, precedes the Old Testament. God's people, Abraham, when, when uh, he gave a tithe or 10% to the priest Melchizedek. Jacob, when he made a commitment to God, he pledged, I'll give 10%. Okay, now we've just totally went from Abraham, Melchizedek, which we have no history. He never he never followed through on any scriptural context or anything about that. 
he just mentioned that a, a whole another human who is a very, which is basically we're circumcised to become under the Abraham's promises. So we didn't even go into anything other than the fact that he gave tithe to Melchizedek. Well, what does that even mean, Mr. Bernard? What does that mean? How do I apply that to what we're talking about today in the new covenant, giving tithes, where it doesn't say anywhere in there that I should give tithes, okay? So there we go. We went from Abraham, Melchizedek, now to Jacob. Now I've got some real good thoughts on Jacob because the fact Jacob said, Lord, if you do this for me, if you, if you bring me to peace with my brother and you do this X, Y, Z, then I will give you a tenth. So there was a deal reached personally on a personal level. Not a, not a hereafter, my kids will do this. Not a hereafter that, that this is going to be instituted for everybody. But this was a personal commitment of Jacob. Read the story yourself. Again, let's go back to the principles that Mr. Bernard uh, uh, gave gave Crest, Crestman uh, earlier the, the floor to, to explain how we should understand scripture, okay? Go back to that, all right? So here we are, so far, zero convincing that I should pay any amount of tithes to the Lord in the new covenant. Of my income to you. So we see godly people not only giving, in sacrifice and offerings from the very beginning. Sacrifice and offerings is not tithe. Now you can say that tithing could be sacrificial and if you were barely making it or something, I don't know, maybe, maybe that could be applied, but that is not what we're talking about here. We are talking about should New Testament believers tithe? Now we're getting right off from, from sacrifices and offerings. We're not talking about sacrifices and offering. We're not trying to blend that in to make a very weak point that he's trying to present here. But having a specific system of tithing. Now, in the New Testament, uh, there is no new system instituted. There's no statement that we're abolishing the 10%. Now it's going to be 7.5% or 15% or whatever you can do. All right, here's here's where we're going to we're going to totally disagree that it's not abolishing the 10%, making it 7% and and so the whole law was abolished. The whole law was abolished. Lo, I come to to take away the first to establish the second. That's in your Bible. That's in the new covenant. Why would Jesus come? And, and keep the old law when the Bible said it was weak and it could not remove sin and, and, and the believers there and to make the believers perfect through Jesus. And up until Jesus, when we, when we get to Jesus, we follow Jesus, not the old law. And you say, well, I, where was that enacted? Okay, in the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts 15. And, and I'm going to show you verse 24. Let me set the stage here. Because you had, uh, they said the, the sect... Just read the whole 15. You'll see it starts at the, at the beginning where it said some of the, some of the sect of the disciples uh, were, 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 fair, were um, Pharisees of the Pharisees uh, were converted to be disciples and they were there at the council, amen, with the Jews and, and, and with, with the apostles. Um, and they were there and they said, you, these, these Gentiles that, that, uh, just got the Holy Ghost, and, and that was great reports. And they said these these Gentiles just got the Holy Ghost, and and the sect of Pharisees that were made disciples said, well, these got to be circumcised. And this was a big old big old ruckus here, and they were back and forth saying they had to be circumcised. And and they're like, Peter says, no. When I when I was the Lord gave me a vision, He said, what I call clean is don't call unclean. The Lord done showed Peter that, that you're not going to be bringing the old law onto these people. So here we go. We get down to the end of, of, of Acts 15, and we finally, these guys uh, have a council meeting, and, and they go back and forth, and, and, and here is what James come back and said in verse 24, Acts 15. He said, but let me tell you before that, he said that why would we try to push the law on 
the Gentiles when he said we or our fathers couldn't even keep the law. Why would we push something like that onto them? Read it in Acts 15. It's there. All right. Verse 24, he ended up saying, For as much as we have heard, and he's telling the, the Gentiles, this is the, the letter going to the Gentiles, that certain which went out from us troubled you with words. We know that they, they came and told you a bunch of stuff about circumcision and all this. That's what he's talking about. Read the scripture, you'll see. Uh, and, and subverting your souls. What is subverting your souls? Trying to give you problems, right? And, 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 and confusion. And he said, saying, this is what they were saying, you must be circumcised. Here you go. This is what they were telling you, that you have to be circumcised and keep the law. That's what James just said, them, that, that they went to you and said, hey, you got to be circumcised and you got to keep the law of Moses. Here's what James conferred with. This is what he ended with. In this same speech, he says, to whom we gave no such commandment. All right. Now, I don't think it's too hard to read into that. And you're not reading into it. This is just what he said. We gave no such commandment that you got to obey the law. And if you read what he's talking about, he said, we or our fathers couldn't even keep the law. So we are talking about the law specifically. And he said, we gave no such commandment that you would need to be circumcised or keep the law. What was under the law? Jesus, and he brings this out. Jesus was talking to about the Pharisees who Jesus was under law at the moment. You got to keep things in context. So when Jesus was talking to the scribes and Pharisees, he said that you, you give tithe the mint and cumin, but you leave out the weightier things such as grace and truth. Okay, read it, you, it's in there. He said, but you left out the weightier things. He said tithing and, 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 and the, of mint and cumin, which was herbs, nothing to do with monetary, and yes, they did have money then. This was in the Roman days, they had plenty of money, the coins, Jesus, Pulled one from the fish to pay the taxes. There was plenty of money to go around. So can't take that off of the New Testament now, Mr. Bernard. So there you go. And Jesus said, you deny the weightier matters, the things that meant something that would actually affect people and not just yourselves. So Jesus was getting on them about that. And Jesus didn't say, oh, he didn't, he didn't say you, you could do that. And, and the other part of money that Jesus Jesus talked about with the lady given the one pence, remember that? So he said, and she has given more than everybody here because she gave what she had. She didn't. He didn't say nothing about a tenth. He there that was not brought up there either. And 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 when you said when he said given to Caesar that which is Caesar's, given to God that which is God's, he didn't say anything about give God his portion of coin. He didn't say nothing about give your tenth to God first and then give to Caesar. You see, these are areas where tithing could have very well, if God meant for it to be, would have been very easily put in in many of these conversations talking about money. Okay, let's, let's listen in a little bit more. In fact, Jesus just assumed people would continue to pay tithes. Jesus just assumed people would continue to pay tithes. Now, I'm going to hit this in very, very hard today. I'm going to hit this very hard because now he is reaching into the mind of Jesus, and he just said that Jesus, in fact, look, let's go back. Just as, here. And Jesus just assumed people would continue to pay tithes. That's a statement. Or 15% or... Whatever you can do, in ten percent now it's going to be seven and a half percent or fifteen percent or whatever you can do. Mm. In fact, Jesus just assumed people would continue to pay tithes. In fact, I want to know when you say I got a fact, I need to know what you've got to show me that that is fact. In fact, Jesus just assumed everyone would continue to pay tithes. Now, I'm going to say that that is about as false as you can get on this subject. And we're going to we're going to we're going to prove that here. 
if he can go that far and stretch and conflate this subject, this here, what he did, statement that he just said, and, 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 and Mr. Bernard likes to go off and say the principle when he has no scripture to back something up. He'll, he'll go to principle. So he, he'll, the principle, okay? So it's not the first time that he, he talks about principle when he has no biblical evidence. He reverts to that to propel his biases, okay? So that's what you'll find out when listening to him. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not slandering Mr. Bernard. I'm telling you that when he's saying some of these things, they are non-biblical. He has no backing, scriptural backing. And definitely, God is not behind many things that this organization is doing or promoting. It is anti-Bible. Okay? So let's talk about conflation of Jesus by Bernard saying that Jesus just assumed, in fact, people would continue to pay tithes. Really, Mr. Bernard? Really? So why wouldn't Jesus assume a whole list of other things that Jesus pinpointed more obvious, more generalized, more simple than a tenth of your income? So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the uh, maybe obedience to scripture. Well, we could assume that just everybody knows you got to obey God, right? Why would we go into that? Why didn't Jesus just assume that if he had assumed tithes, right? Um, did he really need Matthew 19 and 16? Let's, let's go to Matthew 19 and 16. Here we go. This is called the rich young ruler. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. That's what Jesus' response to the rich young ruler was. And the rich young ruler said, and he said unto him, Which? Jesus said, here we go, here we go. Here's the assumptions. Jesus just should have assumed. But listen to what Jesus told him now. Couldn't these all be simply assumed way better than tithes? So Jesus said, thou shalt no, do no murder. Hmm. Murder, really? <laughs> when the rich young ruler, and the Bible said it was the rich young ruler. So let's get the context here. This was a rich person. That means they had lots of money. Why wouldn't the first thing out of Jesus' mouth, Jesus knew it. The Bible spe specifically tells us this was a rich young ruler. That's what they've determined here that he's talking to. So why wouldn't the first thing out of Jesus' mouth be tithing? Well, are you giving your tithes? Are you giving 10%? No, Jesus didn't say nothing like that. Okay? Okay. What did Jesus say that he needed to do to be saved? Mm, I don't know. Tithes? Was it tithes? No. No, it wasn't tithes. He profoundly said, thou shalt not do no murder. Well, that should have been obvious, Mr. Bernard. Why would he say that if tithes would have been assumed? Should murder be like, uh, well, hey, well, I don't even need the Bible to know I probably shouldn't murder somebody. I mean, they're not coming back. I take them away from people. Okay, so there you go. Wouldn't that qualify for an assumption with Jesus? Is Jesus that stupid? I'm not saying he's saying he's stupid, okay? So uh, the second thing he said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Duh. Wouldn't that, shouldn't that be assumed under, under the pretense that, that Mr. Bernard's talking here? Nope. And the third one, he said, don't steal. Okay. The fourth one, he said, don't be lying on people. 
Okay, shouldn't stealing be like, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, my mom taught me, I, we didn't go to church. My mom said, don't steal. You'll go to jail. <laughs> That's kind of obvious, right? Wouldn't that be in a big assumption? Why would Jesus even mention it, right? Okay, so here we are. Uh, don't be lying on people. Uh, number five, here we go, a big one. Honor or love your, your father and your mother. <laughs> Can't we assume that? Wouldn't that fit into your assumptions, Mr. Bernard? No. Okay. So, and Jesus said, the final one here, he said, well, not the final. He said, love your neighbor like yourself. Just treat people like you'd want to be treated. My mom taught me that because, I mean, that was just a golden rule, right? Uh, so, wouldn't that be assumed? But no, Jesus specified this. So, why wouldn't he specify tithing? which is way out of bounds of, of, of these simple other things in life, right? And then number six, he said, love your neighbor like yourself, all right? And then he said, then he went on, Jesus said, and then if you want to be perfect, now the perfect here is talking about if you want to receive the promise, this is what Jesus was talking about. If you want to receive the promise, if you want to be perfect, because the Bible said, making the comers here unto perfect, and, and we talk about Hebrews uh, 11 and 20, uh, 49, or the end of uh, four, uh, 11, chapter 11 in Hebrews, you find that they were not perfect without us. So that perfect means receiving the Holy Ghost, God's spirit, to clean us and, and make us ready for rapture, okay? So he said that then if you want to be perfect, he said, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. Now, what was he saying? You got to make me number one, okay? Now, if you just gave all you had, you, you would die in a few days because you would need to eat, right? So we know Jesus wasn't, wasn't stating that kind of thing because Guess what? You need to eat. You need to pay your bills or whatever, right? Doing to others as you'd have them doing to you. That you couldn't fulfill that if you gave everything away, and you couldn't pay your bills if you owed, you know, Doctor John a bill from yesterday, right? So anyhow, common sense. Learn how to read the scripture, understand it, look at the context, who it's talking to. All right. He said, then if you want perfection or the promise, the Holy Ghost, sell all you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure. You'll have treasure in heaven, he said. What is that? You'll have hope for heaven. That's what treasure in heaven means. You'll have hope in heaven. And then follow me. That's what he told the disciples. Okay, so where is the tithes here? Then Jesus said to his disciples, Rich man hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. I say easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed saying, who can then be saved? Jesus beheld and, and beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Moved on to another story, another thing. There's no tithing mentioned here, okay? So I'm just gonna go a little bit more here and I think we've we've proved our point here in, in, in what I wanted to bring out in this. And, and in no way am I trying to, to belittle, I'm trying to point out the bias of church leadership and, and, and where they're bringing out false doctrine, traditions of men trying to pull the old law back across the new covenant. Nowhere in the New Testament Will you find anywhere that the Bible says to give tithes? Nowhere in there. You will find nowhere. I promise you, it's not in there. You can, you find it, you let me know, all right? So when you look at that, um, let me look here. So 2 Corinthians The Lord loveth as, as every man wisheth in his heart. Let him so give. Here's where tithing could have been. Paul could have brought tithing right here. Hey, make sure you give your tenth. And then on top of that, then he says this. Nope, 
Nobody says anything about tithing. You know why? Because it was the old law. It was for food. It was for things that, that were specific to them in those periods of time that it was given. It was not for everyone, all right? You show me where it was for everyone. You cannot. So it's not there, and you we pushed the old law away. And, and here we go. The point is, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and talking about the cheerful giver. And then it says, let him not give grudgingly or of necessity. Here we go. 2 Corinthians 9 and 7, read it for yourself. As every man wishes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. That law was banished. There is no need, there is no pressure on you any longer to give a tenth. And again, even if you were in the old law, it wasn't for everybody to give a tenth. Nowhere do I find, and if you find it, let me know. I'm willing to be updated on this. But for God loveth a cheerful giver. So don't be giving out of grudge, grudgingly or out of necessity. That was Paul's words, 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. All right? So I just want you to know that, that the Bible says the, the, the sacrifices of God are your lips giving praise. It's a clean heart. It's a heart that, that loves God. That's what God requires of us. And he loves a cheerful giver. And who would not, who has the love of God in them, and, and that's just talked about in James, that you see a brother or sister in need, that, that you wouldn't give them. How dwelleth the love of God in you if you didn't do that? These are the obvious, not tithing, all right? So I just want to let you know that. Let's, let's listen here for another minute. Talk to the Jewish leaders. He said, you know, it's good that you pay tithes. You're, you're so uh, precise. You even pay tithes on the mint in your garden. No, he didn't say that. That is not the scripture. And if you read the scripture, he said you give tithes of mint and cumin. He did not say you even give ties on that. He said you gave ties on mint and cumin. That's it. I think there was a myrrh in there. So that's it. He is conflating scripture. He's lying about scripture, actually, because I've never read what he just said. So my friend, this is a biased situation. This is a false um, teaching uh, this is a lie from hell. The Bible said you will have life more abundantly. You are not even under man. The old priesthood is gone. And I just have to tell you today that this is wrong. This is a bad thing. He should have never even, I didn't, I didn't expect when I did searches, when I did searches here, I did not expect him to even address I, I did not expect him to even address this subject. PPA. And I was kind of hoping that he didn't address this subject because he's got no footing on it. And I knew that whatever he said was going to be wrong and it would have put him in a bad light. And most pastors, most preachers don't even want to talk about it because if they're questioned, they will not have the answers for you. All right, so... I just want you to know that, um, again, have a blessed day. And I, you know, I really, I'm not going to apologize because this is, this is needful. This is needful for you to understand and you to know what's going on in, in these, in these organizations today. And, and I've, I've had videos on this and, and you can go back and watch them. There are at least five well-known TV evangelists, which I don't feel that they're in any of the truth, but they have all came out themselves and recanted about people paying tithes, saying it was wrong, they, they lied about it, they, they wasn't right, and, and that it, it's not there. All right, so anyhow, God bless you. Merry Christmas to you and your family, and Happy New Year. Uh, we'll hope to get some more messages out soon, and uh, we hope you continue watching and learning with us in Jesus' name. Amen.